V24. From the files of the Victoria Police come these true stories of unceasing war against crime, of day and night vigilance that protects our life and our property, and of the nerve centre of the Police Information Bureau, V24. This is the true story of Master of the House. This is a true story from the files of the Victoria Police. Only names, place names and dates have been altered. This is the story of what happened in the home of a man whose only claim to success in life was a bully's boast that he was master in his own house. It begins really years ago in the registry office of a Victorian country town when an 18-year-old factory boy named Charles Wilkinson married a 19-year-old factory girl, Hilda Hodges. It ended one night last year in another Victorian country town under the blanket of the duck in the squalor of an ill-kept, disordered home that for years had known no love, only fear, discontent, and the longing to escape. And the beginning of the end was when two frightened women stood together in the shadows outside that drab weatherboard house. Gosh, Hilt, what happened? Oh, what always happens? He belted me. What are you going to do? What can I do? What did happen? He abused me. He slapped me and punched me. Told me to clear out if I didn't like it. He says I'll never get the kids. There is not mine. He's got it in for me too. He hates me. Yeah, he hates you. He hates everybody. What are you going to do now? Go inside again? No. He might get out of bed. Then let's go for a walk. Oh, yeah. Let's go down to the river and sit under the bridge. Yeah, that's it. Go for a walk. Anywhere, anywhere, but let's get away from here. Yeah. Oh, have a cigarette. Ta. You'll be asleep when you get back. I better sleep up at Auntie May's. I'm not going to go back. I'll get me things tomorrow when he's gone to work. Yeah. He'll be asleep when I get back. <laughs> At seven o'clock the following morning, Dr. Miles Thorpe, a young physician who had not long before set up practice in town, was awakened by a loud, insistent knocking on his surgery door. Oh, doctor, can you come quickly? It's me brother-in-law. Now, just a minute. Suppose you tell me who you are. My name's Hodges, Nettie Hodges. Charlie Wilkinson's my brother-in-law. It's him that's... that's... I see. Well, now, what's wrong with your brother-in-law? Oh, something awful's happened. Hilda, my sister, went to waken him this morning and she found him in bed all covered in blood. What? What happened to him? Oh, I don't know, Doctor. I never seen him. It was Hilda. And where does your sister live? 27 Wooden Street. Oh, please, please hurry. Charlie, Charlie might be dead or anything for all I know. I came in a taxi, Doctor. It's waiting outside. Now, just you come in for a moment and sit down. But, Doctor... Now, I... don't worry. It probably isn't half as serious as you imagine. In my experience, it very rarely is. But in this case, young Dr. Miles Thorpe could hardly have been more wrong. He was met at the kitchen door of the Wilkinson house by an ashen-faced, wild-eyed woman, Hilda. Four young children watched him silently. As led by their mother, he walked into the house, up the little passage to a bedroom, opened the door and entered. He didn't remain in the room for long. Mrs. Wilkinson, you haven't the phone on. No. Uh, where is the nearest phone? There's a box just up the street. I'm going to call the police. Oh, police? Oh, Hilda, is that the police? He's dead, isn't he? Yes, Mrs. Wilkinson, he's dead. Oh, oh sis. He's been murdered, hasn't he? <laughs> I'm afraid that's not for me to say. I think you'd better make some arrangement for the children to, to be looked after somewhere else. For this morning, anyway. Yes, Doctor. And I'd suggest that you don't enter that room again until the police come.
Within a matter of minutes after receiving the call from Dr. Thorpe, local police arrived at the Wilkinson house. The briefest examination of Charles Wilkinson's body, lying on the bed with shocking head wounds and of the blood spattered ceiling and walls, convinced them that all further investigation must be taken over by the experts of the homicide squad. A police car raced from Melbourne with two senior detectives and a photographer. They made a complete record of the room of tragedy before they discussed the case. Well, Jerry, what do you think? Well, whoever did it did it while he was asleep, I'd say. He couldn't have stirred after the first blow. Any ideas about what it could have been done with? I'd say an axe. What axe? Well, while you and Bill were working on the fingerprints, I had a nose around outside. There was an axe in the woodshed. Bloodstones, eh? Well, not exactly. But there's something between the handle and the axe head that we'll have to get analysed. I think it's blood. Mm-hmm. Well, what next? Better have a yarn to the women, eh? I suppose so. Oh, I don't like this sort of job, Lance. No, it's not the best. Well, come on. Mrs. Wilkinson? No. I'm her sister. Yeah. I'm Mrs. Wilkinson. I'm Detective Inspector Lanigan from Melbourne. This is Senior Detective Crosby. Uh, we're here to make some inquiries into your husband's death, Mrs. Wilkinson. Yeah. And this other lady's your sister. That's right. I see. Miss... Uh, Miss Hodges. Uh, I wonder if you'd excuse us for a while, Miss Hodges. We'd like to speak to Mrs. Wilkinson alone. <sighs> That's all right. Nettie, don't go, don't. It's all right, Mrs. Wilkinson. It's perfectly all right. We won't be long. Don't, don't worry, love. I won't go far. It'll be all right. Here. Now, Mrs. Wilkinson, we understand all this is very difficult for you. Yeah. You realise, of course, there's only one possible explanation of his death. Yeah, I know. Charlie was murdered. When did you last see him alive, Mrs. Wilkinson? Tea time yesterday. About half past six or seven, I suppose. But I heard him after that. Well, how do you mean you heard him? He was singing out from the bedroom. Uh, what did he say? <laughs> I wouldn't repeat it. Not to a gentleman. I'm afraid you may have to, Mrs. Wilkinson. He was just abusing me like he was always doing. Then you had had a quarrel? Yeah, we'd had a quarrel. What about? What about? What about? What do we always fight about? I don't know. You and your husband didn't get on? No, we, we didn't get on. We never got on. I see. But this quarrel must have started about something in particular. Yeah, started about Nettie. He ordered her out of the house, called her filthy names, and he belted me. Hmm. And after this quarrel, what happened then, Mrs. Wilkinson? Nettie and I went for a walk to let him cool off. What time would that be? About five to eight. We heard the town hall clock striking just after we started. You can hear it from here. And where did you go with your sister? Down under the Hanson Street Bridge. You can check on that if you want to. Plenty of people saw us, plenty. And what happened when you got there? Well, we just sat on the grass. And you came home later? Yeah. About eleven o'clock I come home. And what happened then? Where was Nettie? Nettie was too scared to come back. She went over and slept at Arnie May's. She said she was going to Melbourne this morning. And what did you do? Well, I crept in as quiet as I could. The light was still on in the kitchen. I left it on when I went out in case the kiddies woke up. I see. Oh. Well, the middle door was shut. I was scared of waking Charlie. So I crept into the other bedroom and got into bed with the baby. So you don't know whether your husband was alive when you came home or not? No, I never went near him. I, I wasn't game to. Did you hear any noise in the night? I, I thought I heard Charlie. What was that? I don't know. About two, I suppose. There was someone walked down the passage. I put me in under the bedclothes because I, I, I thought it was Charlie and he'd go crook at me for leaving the light on. And he didn't speak to you? No. Mrs Wilkinson, this may be a difficult question for you to answer, but... I want you to try. Go on. Do you know anybody who might have had reason to kill your husband? No. No one but me. Why do you say that, Mrs. Wilkinson? Why do I say it? Why do I say it? 
<laughs> if you only knew. But I never killed him. I never, I never. <laughs> okay, Lance, we better give it a spell for a while. Yes, I think so too. I'll get a sister to look after him. I don't know. Maybe it's not as open and shut as it seems. How do you mean? Well, for a start, the woman made no effort at all to conceal the fact that she hated her husband, feared and detested him. Yeah, that's true. That's not the main thing. The doctor calculates the man had been dead about nine or ten hours when he first examined him. Yes. Which would put his death at between nine and ten the night before. Mm, I see. So, um... Uh, if it's true that she and her sister were sitting under the bridge between 8 and 11 o'clock, and the post-mortem bears out the doctor's estimate, then someone else killed him with that axe. The post-mortem did bear out the doctor's estimate. Charles Wilkinson had been battered to death by repeated blows from an axe or some similar implement somewhere about nine or ten o'clock on the evening before the discovery of his body. In just a moment, we'll continue this true story from the files of the Victoria Police. This is a true story from the files of the Victoria Police. Only names, place names and dates have been altered. The detectives investigating the murder of Charles Wilkinson found on the very first day of their inquiry that the case was by no means as straightforward as it had first seemed. Both his wife Hilda and her sister Nettie had a strong motive for killing him, the motive of hate and fear. But Nettie Hodges corroborated Hilda's story. She said they'd left the house between eight and quarter past on the night of the murder and had not returned until after eleven. And so the police began the patient, slow, inexorable routine of inquiry. South Police Station, yes. Detective Inspector Lanigan? Oh yes, just a minute, he's here. For you, Inspector. Thanks, Sergeant. Lanigan. Oh, it's you, Jerry. Uh, yes, sure. What's it? Ah, I see. Now, what names did you say? Uh, Rigby, Thomas Edward. Yeah. Wilcox, Peter Henry. Right, we'll do that. I'll take them. Bye. That was Crosby, Sergeant. He's turned up a possibility from another interview with a Wilkinson woman. Did you hear about some sort of quarrel at the Stonebury Cricket Club meeting on Thursday night? No, sir, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if there was. No? How's that? Uh, there were always quarrels when Wilkinson was a bat. After four beers, he'd take a poke at anybody or everybody. Did you know a Harry Wilcox and a Ted Rigby? Yeah, sure. Wilcox runs the garage on the main road coming into town. Ted Rigby's a tobacconist in Hampton Street. Okay, thanks a lot. If anybody's looking for me, I'll be back about five, I guess. I'm going around to see the garage man. A blue at the cricket club meeting? Well, yes, I suppose you could call it that, but it was a one-sided sort of blue. Charlie had a few in, was firing off his mouth. You know how it is. Yes, yes, I know. Was he uh, a difficult sort of chap, this Wilkinson? I'll say. You and a man called Rigby were on the receiving end Thursday night, is that right? Yeah, but we never took no notice of old Charlie. They were blows struck, weren't they? Well, who told you that? Well, what happened? Well, Charlie did his block and took a punch at me, but I ducked. I see. Poor old Charlie. Couldn't fight his way out of a lolly bag. Yeah? The only person he ever hung one on was his missus. He gave her Larry Dew. From all accounts, it... Go on. Uh, 
I wouldn't have said that. Oh, never mind. Everybody says it as far as we can make out. Now, what happened after you ducked the punch he swung at you? Oh, nothing much. Ted Rigby and I grabbed him and put him outside to cool off, was all. I see. And did he use the words, I'll do for you two blanks? Oh, he might have. I don't remember. He was always going to do for people when he had a few in with Charlie. All right, thanks, Mr. Wilcox. I don't expect we'll have to bother you any more. Oh, uh, just one thing. Yeah? Where did you spend last night, huh? It's truth. You don't think I've done Charlie in, do you? No, oh, Mr. Wilcox, I don't. But it's my job to check everybody if I had anything to do with him. Yeah, I suppose so. You'll appreciate that. Yeah, somebody killed him and that somebody has got to be found. Well, I'm in the clear and so's Ted Rigby. Him and me took our wives over to the return soldiers' ball at Bairnsdale last night. A special bus took a whole mob of us. You can check that easy enough. Okay. Thanks for your help. And so the inquiry went on all through that day and late into the night. In the early hours of the following morning, the Homicide Squad men compared notes in the local police station. Well, we've got no excuse to knock anybody else out of bed tonight, Jerry. Mm, no. Uh, I wish I were in bed. Me too. <laughs> so far, so bad. What's it add up to? Well, as far as I can make out, about half the people in the district could have had a motive for doing Wilkinson in. Hmm. Yes, from all accounts, a pretty double work was the late Charlie Wilkinson. It makes it tough. Yes, it makes it tough. A nasty drunk. Unreliable on everything he did. Treated with contempt and dislike by everybody he came into contact with. Well, that's all very want to talk about people despising and disliking him. Contempt and dislike aren't motives for murder. Yeah, true. The only person with a really strong motive for kidding him is his wife. Yeah, I suppose you're right. She's a simple soul, as simple as they come. Or, coming to think of that alibi, is she? You mean you think the sister may be lying to cover up for him? It could be. Yes, I've been wondering that too. Unless we can turn up someone else with a sufficiently strong motive, that's the likeliest explanation, isn't it? Hmm. Yes, you're right. I think we'd better call off checking on everybody who couldn't stand the sight of Charlie Wilkinson and uh, get to work on that alibi. Yeah, it'll be tough. The two of them were seen under the bridge, you know. Yes. Oh, and by the way. What? What happened about the axe? Was it blood between the head and the handle? Hmm. It'll take a day or two to find out for sure if it was his blood group. Oh, I see. And there was no other evidence in the house, none at all. No. But I'm getting the ashes in the kitchen stove looked at. There was something in them besides wood ash. The following morning, Detective Inspector Lanigan and Detective Crosby began upon their new line of inquiry. Inquiry designed to test beyond all doubt the truth of the statement made by Hilda Wilkinson and her sister that they had left the house very soon after eight o'clock on the night of the murder. Yeah, I see her. I say good night to her. I had just stopped my girlfriend. We had been to the cinema. It must have been just after 11. Now, I often heard the Wilkinsons rowing. He was always beating her up when he was shot, yelling out to each other who was master of the house. But I never heard nothing that night. Sure, I saw the light on. Baby was crying and I got up to change her. Must have been after two. We saw them both under the bridge. They often went down there to sit when he started busting things up, showing you who was the boss. The bully. Must have been about ten, but I, I couldn't be certain to the minute. No, not a thing, Inspector. I was listening to D24 on the radio, so I wouldn't have heard anyway. And then, when it seemed that this patient checking would yield no results, the break came. The detectives interviewed an elderly woman whose home was not far from the Wilkinson's house. You see, Mrs. Lawton, anything at all that you can recollect about that evening might be of the greatest assistance to us. Oh, oh dear. Well, it's so hard to be sure. 
Yes, yes, I did see her go out, poor thing. I'm almost sure I did. About what time would it be? Uh, let me see. Yes, that's right. I saw her going out after she'd chopped the wool. She'd been chopping wood, you say? Oh, yes, she always chopped the wood. I know it's a dreadful thing to say, officer, but Charlie Wilkinson did treat her so badly. Yes, yes, I'm afraid everybody agrees about that, Mrs Lawton. She was up at first light the next morning. Before five, I remember that distinctly. Before five, did you say? Yes, I'm afraid I sleep badly, you know. Yes, well, please go on. Well, I woke up before dawn and I just lay tossing and turning, so at twenty to five I got up to make myself a cup of tea. And you saw Mrs Wilkinson? Yes, it was barely light. I saw her distinctly in the front yard. She was dressed. Does she always get up so early? Oh, no, I'm sure she doesn't. They're not early risers. Now, please, Mrs Lawton, think back to the night before. What time did you hear Mrs Wilkinson chopping the wood? Oh, dear, now let me think. Um, now, what was I doing? My husband, um, he'd gone out to visit some friends. Yes, and what did you do? Let's see. I did some dining and listened to the radio. Yes, it was after... After what, Mrs Lawton? It was after the news. Was that the seven o'clock news? Oh, no. My husband didn't go out till nearly half past seven. It must have been after the nine o'clock news. <sighs> Mrs Lawton, you're quite sure about it being after the nine o'clock news that you heard Mrs Wilkinson chopping wood? Oh, yes, I'm quite certain about that. Thank you, Mrs Lawton. Thank you very much indeed. Once more, the men of the Homicide Squad questioned Hilda Wilkinson. This time, however, it was in the office of the local police station. Mrs Wilkinson, do you know why we asked you to come here? To ask me more questions about him, I suppose. Yes, we have reason to believe that you've not told us everything you know about your husband's death. I've told you all I know. I've told you the truth. What time did you get up on the morning you discovered your husband's body? I don't know. Four or five, I think. You always get up so early? No. No, I don't. Then why did you get up at five this morning? I don't know. I, I woke up shaking. Why? I just... I just had a feeling something had happened. Then what did you do? Oh, I lit the fire on the kitchen stove and... Then I went in to wake him and... You uh, found out what had happened? Yeah. I found out what had happened. Mrs Wilkinson, why was it your sister Nettie called the doctor, not you? I ran down to the station. She was going to Melbourne on the seven o'clock train. I knew she'd be there. But why didn't you call the doctor? It was the kids. I didn't want to leave them alone in the house with him. I see. Now, you say you and your sister left the house just after eight. Yeah. Nettie knows that. But if that is so, how does it happen you were seen and heard chopping wood on your backyard at nine o'clock? <laughs> What would you say if we were to tell you that you were seen leaving the house much, much later than you and your sister claim? What could I say? I've never done it. I tell you, I've never done it. Not Charlie. I wouldn't have dared. I couldn't. Come, Mrs. Wilkinson, you're only upsetting yourself. You might as well tell us the truth. We'll find it all out in the end, you know. Today, tomorrow, or the next day. Well, Mrs. Wilkinson? No good. It's no good. I did it. I did it, Charlie, with the axe. But I didn't mean to kill him. I never meant to kill him. Where was he when you hit him? Lying on the bed. Was he asleep? I don't know, I don't know. I was afraid. Afraid. You burned your dress on the stove, didn't you? How do you know? We checked on the ashes. Was it blood-stained and you burnt it? Was that why? <laughs> Mrs. Wilkinson, you'll be charged with the murder of your husband. It's my duty to warn you that you are not obliged to say anything further unless you wish. But if you do make a statement, it'll be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. That is the end of this story. Murder as it is, not storybook murder. Sordid, despairing, violent, horrible. 
Although Mrs. Wilkinson and her sister, panicked by the terrible events in the house that night, concocted a clever alibi, patient inquiry established its falseness. Although Charles Wilkinson was a hated man, no one hated him enough to kill him, except the woman who was in his power. Yes, the master of the house is a story of murder as it is. The jury before which the case was tried took the view that Hilda Wilkinson's act was not premeditated, but she was found guilty of manslaughter and sentenced to a long term of imprisonment. Those to whom the pity of the community must go out are the four children of that tragic and fatal marriage. Only names, place names and dates were altered in this true story. It was dramatised in the files of the Victoria Police by Edward Dawkin. And now this is Roland Strong saying goodbye until the same time next week, when there will be another true story in this series, D24, which is produced in the studios of Hector Crawford Productions by Dorothy Crawford. Thank you.